So um, adapt or disappear. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most adaptable to change. And the question here is how fast are we adapting to this change which is happening around us all the time? It's driven by technology as business transformation or businesses are the way we used to run businesses have changed. So how are we adapting to that? And we really need to change at this point in time. If you look at the recent surveys done by KPMG and Deloitte as well, about 51% of the audit committee members says um, the work that audit is doing is not on the board agenda. And that's a, that's, that's a big thinking point for us when audit function is doing something and that is not on board agenda, they might be doing some good work, but that doesn't really matter. So, so the question here is how fast are we adapting? And um, I, I, would, I would use the Chinese proverb which says, when winds of change blow, you either build walls or you build windmills. So the question here to everyone is, are we building walls when facing these um, uh, winds of change or are we building windmills? You know, we can embrace this technology and embrace these change and use it to our benefit. Um, changing realities, data is the new oil and, 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 and these are interesting insights. Um, the major um, oil, the oil majors BP and Royal Dutch Shell in 2017, they generated more cash uh, when oil price averaged at $45 a barrel versus what it was in 2014, more than $100 a barrel. Just imagine how significant that change is that they're in a position so it's all driven by the data they relied on the data they did their business transformation process simplification and you know more technology driven changes and that led them to generate more cash a huge impact and disruption has already happened we see it happening all the time around us world's largest taxi company owns no taxis largest accommodation provider owns no real estate Largest phone company own no telco infrastructure. Most valuable retailer has no inventory. Most popular media owner creates no content. So a traditional way of running the business, if you Google and you know just check on top five um, organizations worldwide in last five to seven years, you would see um, you know, the technology driven companies have taken over very recently versus a traditional business if you can if you can take an example of any um, oil and gas sector or the stuff so the businesses are changing the business model have changed significantly so how has internal audit adapted to that changed model are we adapting to that or are we just you know happy doing the stuff that was applicable a few years ago and we're still doing that we need to see there the choice for us is very clear innovate or become irrelevant so it's, it's, it's a simple choice. You're either at one creating automation or you're the one being automated. So, you know, uh, we need to see which side we are at. And I, I keep asking this question in my um, presentation that when was the last time when you did something new for the first time? You know, if, if you can see you did something new at very recent times and you're doing something that probably you're adapting to the change. And if it was long, long ago, that probably we need to think. And especially uh, uh, current circumstances, COVID-19 has raised a big question mark the way we used to um, do our business. We spent you know, weeks and months putting together an audit plan and we got it approved through audit committee and board and now suddenly that's, that's no more applicable. Technically speaking, in, in my organization as well, we've pretty much, pretty much discarded that and we're totally focused on the real risk faced by the business. But what happened in the real world? Are we, if, if just park this COVID-19 situation aside, are we agile enough to adapt to the changes and or to these risks which keep happening all the time? You know, let's ask that question. And let's move on on our um, typical risk-based auditing approach. Um, so I keep asking that question, what is the purpose of risk management? Is it managing risks? Or is it helping the business deliver its strategy through focusing on achievement or of its strategic business objectives? So that's a major shift in the thinking process. If we do our risk assessment with the mindset of managing risk versus supporting the business to achieve its objectives, the whole focus changes. We need to bring in 
business objectives into our focus and we need to see how we are delivering how we're helping the organization that so um farooq i would um, i would hand it over to you and if you can lead us what are the different levels of um automation and to what extent we can apply artificial intelligence throughout our processes yeah, uh, very good start, Imran. You know, like I think it's uh, hardly 5 a.m. over there for you, and you know, <laughs> you know you're completely energetic. Uh, so, so, thank you, okay. thank you very much for joining okay. so early. Uh, so, uh, f uh, taking from where you've stopped, uh, it's very simple. You know, uh, this is a space where we have to agree and accept. Uh, you know, where exactly are we uh, in terms of our business practices? I. I don't think we have all of the manual practices, but I think most of us would be in between the manual and digitized zone where we have a lot of isolated system without talking to each other. Or I would see many of us uh, have, have understood this and already started working on it with having integrated digital platforms. And, uh, uh, you know, technology, uh, you know, people who love to go with technology have seen a lot of organization going with the advanced analytics and uh, you know then infusing the rpa and ai engines into their business strategies so but whatever state are you in it's very important that you know you understand uh, that you know the the kind of data which goes in the quality of data which goes in is the most important thing you know you may have the best of the best engine in place but if you don't fill it with the right data it's going to have uh, a difficult time for you absolutely and how does this maturity level looks like from um, level one to four, Farooq? I don't think I, uh, I need to explain the level one and two because the audit, uh, the auditors are the most, uh, you know, you know, the, the best people to do this every time. Uh, so it's basically you identify what happened and, you know, and also what is happening. Right. And the level two is basically the kind of investigations you do when you have certain findings in place or the kind of root cause analysis you do. So you look at what happened and also you need to consider what's happening. And uh, then you look at, uh, you know, why did it happen? And the level three is something which is really interesting because looking at what happened, what is happening and why did it happen? You know, we have the machine learning capabilities, which will, which will help you to understand what is likely to happen. Okay, that sounds quite promising, but I think, uh, you know, we've been doing the what if analysis for a long time, but we have got things which is above and beyond uh, what if analysis. And the level four, you know, even if it is a bit of a complex scenario, that is where the real fun starts, where you get to see a lot of recommendations. You know, the system is suggesting you, hey, you know what, this is where you are. You know, I want you to try these many things. Okay, you say that, okay, you've got a business impact analysis done. Okay, these are the potential impacts. Now, these are recommendations from my side. Okay, is it really feasible? Or are we too optimistic? Let's look uh, forward and see what best comes out of it, Imran. All right, Farooq, now, yeah. now this makes me really um, excited when you're saying we're moving from what has happened in the past and what will happen. And it's, it's about the theme I can relate to myself where we say, you know, don't audit the don't audit where the risk has been and audit where the risk is taking you and where it, it will. So, you know, um, it's, it's, um, it, 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 it's really amazing to know that you were able to predict it and, you know, and you, through these predictive analysis, you can say, yes, that would happen. And, you know, um, that really makes the audit function very forward looking. I think it is, uh, you know, that's a way forward. Uh, so we accept it. We don't accept it. You know, sometimes we will have to wait for a situation like this to adopt technology or you can be the leading, uh, you can be, uh, you know, the leader or the team who, who would lead the show with everything is adopted earlier. So it's up to you. I don't know. The first thing I would probably say is to understand and see what are the data points we have or what are the kind of uh, technology platforms we have. Take an inventory of that and see that, you know, how often they talk to each other. And also don't forget to count the number of spreadsheets you have, especially the ones you work on weekends. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is a good one. The weekend was a really tough one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So oh, I'm, I'm going to through process by process, Farooq, I'm going to challenge you in each process. Uh, 
So um, I've just listed down these processes here, um, a typical uh, kind of audit cycle where we start with internal audit strategy, risk assessment, planning, fieldwork, reporting, and then follow up and issue management. Um, let's um, go one by one. So what I've done here, I've listed some of the pain points that I feel, and it's not just me, a lot of other audit functions, um, a lot of other chief audit executives that I've worked with, they're in the same boat. So I would want to hear some of, uh, some of the solutions from your side and how you take it. But, uh, firstly, starting with risk management, and an audit function, we as auditors, we are very happy saying that, yes, we are doing a risk-based audit, and um, it's a very um, kind of um, effective approach. But my problem with that is if we are basing our risk assessment based on the risk register, and I call them list registers, um, uh, those risk registers which are not tied with the organization objectives and strategies, we see those risk registers are very siloed on a function level and they don't talk to the organization business and strategy. And that's why we keep hearing from the um, audit committee and executives that the work that audit function is doing is not on our agenda because there is a disconnect here because our underlying principle, the, the basic document that we are starting that that is not connected with how the decisions are made within the organization and if this risk management function or this risk management approach is not embedded in the decision making that's not going to take me anywhere as an auditor and other piece high more and low risk rating is not enough in my opinion Farooq, because what happens firstly this is a point in time approach i'm doing um sitting in um, April 2020, I doing my risk assessment and this high moderate and low is a snapshot as of today. It's telling me this is high moderate and low as of now. What happens with these risks moving six months down the line? If I'm basing my audit plan on the risk on today and putting high moderate and low, how does it change moving forward six months down the line, one year down the line? Does it still stay high moderate and low? And second piece, what I see really missing here is that that this risk rating is not linked with the risk appetite of the organization. If an organization, for example, not-for-profit organization or charity, if they've set their risk appetite at really, really low level, so even a moderate risk might not be acceptable for them. But if I apply my high moderate list, high moderate and low risk methodology in every scenario without having to have any consideration of the risk appetite of the organization. I'm missing the trick there. I may accept a risk. I may go ahead with a different approach of a moderate risk when it might not be acceptable. While another more aggressive organization, maybe a high risk might be acceptable. So this is um, another issue. And I, and I keep saying this audit universe is a pretty much outdated concept where we have list of inventory of areas where we need to audit. We need to focus more on the risk universe where we start with the business objectives and strategies and see what are the risks surrounding those. And then we start looking into these. So um, I feel these, these are the things which, which keep me stopping, which, you know, stops my internal audit function um, to be a trusted advisor. And how do we, uh, from that backward looking function, take it to more forward looking future focused uh, function, Farooq and um, Ranjit, would you please enlighten me as to how, um, can technology take me forward on this? Yeah, this is uh, this is basically one of the most important areas of uh, the entire process because you have your internal audit strategy and the first thing you do is always trying to understand what are the potential uncertainties you have and against your organizational objectives. So it is not just a risk assessment done, you know, against a list of risk identified. So the first thing it is, it connects to the organizational objectives. So when it comes to technology, the biggest promise technology can bring into internal internal audit as a practice is we all understand that the risk assessment is done on a predefined intervals and it is a static exercise for many of us right so what the technology can bring in is a completely proactive risk management system which is more like real time and live right so you're not doing a risk assessment where let's say ranjit will explain it later where you say that you know wherever you see an anomaly 
uh, you know you you get to see uh, you get to you get to see uh, you know you get notified about that specific thing so if i have to specifically explain about some of the core features and in internal audit we all do risk assessments you know while doing the risk assessment what we look at is that you know uh, you, you as you said you look at your high medium low we yeah. don't want to stop yeah. there when you say the high medium low the system would be able to detect uh, the uh, in the potential impact and give you uh, the potential impact in terms of your financial impact in terms of your reputational impact in terms of your regulatory impact these are not listed in your menu but basically the machine is recommending you this and saying that okay hey you know what you know these were the impacts in the past when you have deviated from these things so that is typically your compliance issues and these are your performance issues because when you have these kind of an impact when you had this kind of an impact in the past this is how it is impacted in your business so it is directly connecting to your business and the risk assessment what you're carrying out is against the organizational goals it is not within a department of an internal audit or within a function of an internal audit. So that's the first thing. And the second thing, what it does is that, you know, we all have a beautiful business process portfolio. Yeah. And when you look at a business process portfolio, that's governed by the controls, the internal controls. So looking at the current scenario, the best example I can give you is that, you know, if you have got the access control, so instead of 10,000 people working from one office or four or five offices what we have now is that you know the access location or the place where the system is accessed or the technology is accessed is 10000 access now how do you really control what kind of anomalies can you detect right this is this is a very important thing and similarly when you look at uh, you know the typical human resources control as an example you literally have to audit to find out what is going wrong or you need to have certain predefined flags you know to give you those flags coming in but we are talking about a real time detection of any anomalies here and you get to see a proactive business uh, you know business controls and based on what is really happening so i would also ask renji to come up and say that uh, you know the, the the risk detection side of it so how 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 is it uh, how is it sounding to you imran you know like when you look at this kind of uh, features coming in so i think um, this, this this sounds quite interesting to me farooq and as you're saying that we're moving from a static risk register to a more uh, dynamic risk assessment where where the you know the system is feeding in and it's uh, it's updating my risk assessment throughout the year and I've got those um, leading risk indicators built into the system and they're linked with the business objectives. That's that sounds very interesting to me, um, Farooq. Yeah, and moreover, you know, when you look at your business process controls or you know your internal controls, it gives you uh, it gives you a notification, and it can go with an escalation as well, you know, as and when required. So you're not looking at those controls failing only when you do the audits. So you have got uh, you know a real time monitoring with all the required users getting their alerts and notifications awesome. as and when required. Let me go to Ranjit. Ranjit, would you want to um, bring in some technology perspective into this? Yes, Imran. No? Uh, as Farooq explained, uh, a real-time uh, proactive risk monitoring is uh, fairly possible using uh, the technologies like uh, machine learning or deep learning and uh, big data. These are recent technologies. So I would say uh, you know, the entire process of uh, risk detection to uh, recommendation of actions can be automated, I would say. So uh, when I see uh, with some of the organizations that I worked, uh, they generate a lot of data and store it, taking a lot of space, but they never utilize majority of the data what they store. So uh, I have seen this with uh, some man manufacturing organizations. You know, they deal with the IoT, Internet of Things data, the sensor data from their manufacturing uh, plan. So what we can do is we can apply AI on top of the sensor data to predict, let's say, uh, the risk of a machine to fail you know, before it happens, before the failure, maybe a few days or something, we can able to predict it. So that's a good example of you know, how we can utilize the data and uh, you know, to predict the risks. No, I... Likewise, uh, we can you know, detect several other types of risks using the algorithms, uh, you know, uh, the cyber threats, financial frauds, and many. 
So this is one of the you no. Know, uh, there is one more advantage when we are you know using the AI based risk detection model. It can not only predict the risk, but it can also recommend the actions to be taken. So that's a big advantage when we oh, yeah. go with the AI based risk uh, prediction algorithm. Uh, this is this is quite interesting. So it's it's not just you know your dynamic risk assessment, which is um, uh, getting updated every now and then with every click of a risk. It's also coming up with the recommendation and suggesting areas. I think let's move on and talk about planning a little bit. Um, so uh, my dilemma here is change doesn't occur once a year, and internal audit risk assessment assessment must be dynamic, not static, and also, we need to focus on the risks that matter to the organization objectives, and those are the risks that need to be addressed in the audit plan. And sometimes we see, you know, there are certain engagements coming um, out of our risk assessments and our internal audit planning, and we really need to ask this question from a business perspective. Will this engagement really add value to the business? Because, you know, if I'm doing my audit planning based on the risk assessment, which is not so dynamic, how do I make sure that the changing business needs are catered into my audit plan? And how do I use this, Farooq, how do I use this dynamic risk assessment that you've just explained into my very um, kind of uh, focused internal audit plan, which is, which is more valuable. Once I deliver on, those, on that internal audit plan, I really meet board and audit committee objectives. How do we do that? How do we make sure that this risk assessment is actually feeding into my audit plan app, my audit plan, which is very dynamic and linked with the business objectives. Yeah, uh, first thing first, uh, you know, so whenever you do an annual audit planning, let's say that, you know, you plan for an audit for an year. Uh, let's assume that you've got 100 auditors and you've got around 3,000 to 4,000 processes in place and uh, you've got you've done your risk assessment so while doing this practice you know you've got all those known factors which is playing around every time you do that so the first thing is that the amount of time is spent uh, to create such a uh, you know such a plan so even if you know that you know you've got a template which comes out after your efforts of three to four months if i may rate or two to three months i don't know you know if you're talking yeah, about that yeah. size what, what do you think what's what's the size yeah, you're talking about, if you're talking, about the, if you're talking about the organization of that size and with complex and i've worked with various organizations starting from professional services firms to oil and gas sector now with government sector and it's um, in a bigger organization with complex uh, processes it takes weeks and months sometimes for you and then you know we sometimes ask that question by the time we have this whole audit plan ready it took two, two to three months this typical audit plan is it really relevant now if you're going to execute that especially this COVID-19 has asked big question marks as to you know you did your typical audit completed your typical audit planning process and you know it's more relevant so how do we how do we come out of this typical approach and we say we have an audit plan which is fed by the information all the time yeah so like what we have said in the beginning so if you have got a proactive risk assessment system which is giving you a real-time dashboard with with a complete uh, list of internal controls and it's low performing and high performing area so what if if i come and tell you like if i press a button saying that okay auto audit plan generate you click on that and if you get two audit plans, how would this sound to you? That sounds too good to be true, Farooq. Come on, give me a break here. You're saying the, the amount I used to spend, you know, two to three months to put together an action plan. I'm sitting on my um, desktop. I'll just press a button and that would generate an audit plan. Is, is this for real? Yeah, this sounds very easy, but it is not that easy to do that. We have tested this with, uh, uh, you know, some of our projects, uh, but successfully. Awesome. What I'm trying awesome. to tell you is that, you know, the output of your risk assessment practice, you know, where you get to see uh, the performance levels of your organizational objectives, your business performance against the identified risk, the potential impact and the size of the impact in different domains. So once you have them listed, the rest of the things are all known to you. The most dynamic things 
are your continuous risk assessment where you consider everything around your organization and beyond your organization. Once you have this difficult exercise done, the rest of the things are all known, Imran. So you're talking about your audit categories. Maybe you have 30, 40 audit categories. You have, uh, you know, I don't know, from different region to region, you, will got, you have got a lot of compliance and regulatory standards and best practices. You have got your, uh, you know, previous internal audit results. You've got your audit team and the competency levels. Plus, you've got all those isolated and integrated, uh, you know, data points or systems which are up and running. So all what, what's going to happen is that simply all those are going to be pushed into one funnel, right? And whatever you know as an internal audit team, that will be taught to the system. Basically, that's a learning process for the machines initially, you know, applying all the known criteria. So we're talking about applying all those known criteria like the risk assessment results, the audit categories, and, uh, you know, the auditors and competence. And then what happens is that, you know, we think as single dimension, you know, like we, we think and the, the, the machine can think multidimensional. So what happens is that, you know, it will start bringing the associations and patterns and relationship using different technology platforms, you know, and, you know, what you get out of it is simply the blue and red, what you see on the screen. So you get two plans, spend all your time, which is an editable plan, spend all your time doing it. And then you can probably say that, okay, I'm going to choose, you know, this is how I'm going to choose it. So how, how does this sound to you, you know, like as, 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 as an audit professional? So Farooq, I know it's not optimistic to say, yeah, yeah. No, this sounds very, very exciting to me. I, I'm, I'm really trying to imagine once I have all that input into the system, I would just be able to generate. This saves a lot of my, my staff time, um, you know, in terms of number of hours input, I can really use that um, staff and my team towards more, um, uh, you know, consulting um, sort of business and where we can work closely with the business to add more value. So if I'm saving a, a lot of time here um, and for Luke, this, I, I also see this helping me in, you know, making my function more future focused where I'm able to predict the weather because now my uh, you know, risk assessment is linked with the business processes and the way they change my risk assessment gets updated and that information is now fed into my audit plan. So this is awesome. You know, if I have that sort of solution, I would say this would really help me deliver um, the, you know, uh, my, uh, to complete my deliverables and to make an impactful um, and to complete an um, in impactful work here. Uh, so that's that's really great. And um, what sort of um, are you referring to um, recommendation engine uh, like uh, Netflix here? I think uh, you know that's that's the best way to explain it. Renji, Ranjit, would you like to take it up? Yeah, I can uh, take it, uh, uh, Farooq. Uh, so my understanding is uh, Farooq and Imran. You no, know, every audit plan we generate you no know, must be supported by some evidence, right? So the knowledge. No, also the knowledge we learned in the past. So data helps us in uh, all these cases. You know, uh, we can utilize the historic data to uh, collect these evidences. For example, uh, the evidence of uh, success of an audit plan, let's say. Organizations uh, have a lot of data available from you know, uh, financial transactions, documents, and so on. So we can use the technologies like uh, natural language processing, to go through all these data and uh, you know, collect and evaluate the evidences. So in this example, we can see uh, uh, you know, the, how the recommendation engine come, uh, uh, come up with uh, you know, recommending the uh, videos to the uh, Netflix uh, usage, right? I can compare it with uh, in case of you know, audit plan. Let's say the AI algorithms will uh, look into the, the way uh, audit planning is currently done. It can look at, uh, look at the outcomes, the pros and cons of each audit audits, and come up with the recommendations of uh, you know the optimal audit planning. Like uh, Farooq said, a one-click button you uh, know getting uh, showing us uh, multiple uh, audit plans. Uh, the similar way we get the you know recommendation from a, a Netflix or in you know in case of uh, uh, Amazon. Now based upon my purchase, if when I buy something, you know it says uh, you may also like this product. So yeah. a lot of recommendation engines in the other field and the similar recommendation engines we can bring into uh, you know the audit planning and that makes an auditor life easier. I believe. 
Oh, this is this is great, and then this um, Netflix audit plan looks very fancy to me, Ranjit. <laughs> I like it. Uh, it it brings in a lot of entertainment. Okay, so that's real great insights, and I really um, appreciate that how the whole process um, is being transformed through artificial intelligence and technology, and that really addresses a lot of pain points here. Um, let's move on to the uh, most painful part of audit, I would say audit field work and in this time and age it's always hard to ask for more resources it, it's becoming increasingly difficult to convince audit committee and board for, with, for more staff and you know it's all boils down to doing more with less and i also keep saying staff for the audits we perform not perform audits based on the staff we have i've seen in many Internal lawyer functions, they see typically we have these many, um, for example, these many IT auditors, these many financial auditors or operational auditors. So we can pick and have these many operational auditors and IT auditors and financial auditors and all that stuff. But it has to be upside down. This, these audits should be driven by the need of the business. And and then when it comes to um, typical audit field work, um, Farooq, I see that mundane and audit tasks take a lot of time and effort without having uh, to deliver visible benefits. Um, I do understand that the core of audit that we do, but how do we do the same thing with much more efficiency? You know, uh, we typically go by developing testing strategy, review and assess design of internal controls, operating effectiveness, we review process flow, process flows, we do document review and then identify control weaknesses. So there are a lot of step-by-step -step process and these are mundane tasks that we have to do. And I, I, and I see in a typical audit, audit field work takes the most um, amount of time. So how do we kind of look into this field work and we be more efficient having to have more impactful results and spending less time. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what we have discussed uh, as as a previous activities in terms of your uh, internal, uh, you know, the risk assessment and the internal audit planning. So I think we have already saved half of your time. So if you've got enough people to run through the system more efficiently, but again, let's look at the most important elements of uh, the uh, the audit process or the field work. So we are talking about the document review and interviews, and, and also we will have a chip chat on the testing process. So there are many other ways, but we have, we let we thought we'll stick to the basics, right? So what if, if you have got uh, a document of 10,000 pages, which has got all the technical complexities, or what if, if you have got 100, uh, 100 uh, uh, you know, uh, contracts, which is got, which is of high value contracts and the most complex projects, you know, how would you review them, you know, using all your human intelligence? Because if somebody throws me a black and white document, which, which has got 100 pages, I would say, okay, I'll read it a bit, you know, then I'll probably pass it on to someone else. I don't about this but here what we are talking about is that you know those 10,000 page information or those hundred procedures information is extracted using machine learning capabilities so this is where where Ranjit was talking about the natural language uh, processing and uh, you know where you talk about extracting information simply read in you know read understand and interpret or I would say extract read uh, you know and interpret once you do that, you can also map the information. So we have so much of redundancies lying down in, in our or duplications lying down within our own existing documentation. So instead of looking at them, so what you're doing is that, you know, you're asking the machine to read and give you the insights. And from there, we know that, you know, the, the, uh, the maturity of uh, the machine learning in terms of the document review, even if it is used very highly, it is only 70 to 80 percentage. That is where your team can come and start working on it. You know, say that, okay, this is the ins these are the insights. Mm -hmm. And you can apply all the criteria, what you generally use based on your human intelligence. Then the machine can start learning it and apply its own thoughts. Right. So that's the first bit of it. You know, how is it sounding to you in terms of a document review? You know, what's it like? Oh, that that's that's really that really puts me at ease because, you know, 
uh, in a typical, especially for example, working for government sector, you are you are bombarded with the documents, and you know you really have to go through before you start audit, and that takes a lot of planning and field work time. And if you have um, you know something which goes through the whole document and comes up with a kind of an executive summary with the key points and where you can go through and fine tune that thing, that would really make a big difference. That's awesome. Yeah, it can summarize, it can give you the insights and you know, it can basically even track and you know and even recommend so but you know the depending on so when you work with the government organizations we get to see a lot of handwritten information as well the minutes of the meeting for the board generally comes in a handwritten information yeah 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 then you type it in so it's all double work what you do right so once you do the uh, your your document review the next thing is an interview you know i don't want to really uh, you know test the typical interview process because that's where the auditor enjoys the most uh, you know talking to people uh-huh. right or we we say that okay let's keep it as it is but there are facilities you know where if if we take this recording of this webinar probably pass it on to the machine intelligence so it can get the insights out of the discussions what we are having right depending on uh, the kind of culture what you have within your organization, this can be tested, right? So the best example would be if you have a call center and if you receive, you know, hundreds of calls in terms of complaints or whatever it is, you know, it can always be tested against the voice, uh, you know, voice analytics. So this is, I would say, you know, I'm not a big fan of voice analytics during an interview, but yes, technology can do it. But again, you know, personally, you know, even after promoting a lot of technology solutions, uh, you know, the likes of AI, I would still say I would love to sit with an, in a person and yeah, talk yeah. to them. I physically. think it's all. I, yeah. I, or I, like what we are doing. I think, uh, you know, like uh, I see a question coming from Ahmed saying that, okay, how do we do the audit now? This is how we do the audit. You know, so you've got the technology, you are sitting in Zoom and you're saying that, okay, we are doing it. So, but you, is your culture accepting it? I don't know, you know, like that's sort of something you have to, yeah. I think uh, under the current circumstances, um, under COVID-19, it has put more emphasis uh, on technology, the way we do audits now. We need to leverage more on technology, more on analytics, if we have to get real uh, stuff out of out of that field works and auditing. So, you know, when, we are working remotely it's um, it's um, it's it's a challenge to 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 do those typical field works but but if if we have the right technology and right tools we can extract the information we can you know uh, get the information we need and we apply those analytics that that can really take um, take thing forward so yeah. um and i think this interview technique can be really handy if you're um if we are into investigations, that, that can really help. Yes, I think, yeah, during investigations, because, you know, it really works well, yeah. So uh, even post-interview, it really works well, yeah. It like, it's like, you know, the movies, what we watch uh, in general, you know, especially, yeah, those F- FBI questioning kind of a thing, interrogation, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Ranjit, would you like to take up the, the, uh, the testing process and see how it works? Yeah, yeah, Farooq. So, oh, uh, you know, or what's my understanding is like uh, sampling or subsetting is or what you generally use for the audit testing, right? To to evaluate some aspect of information that you have. So that means uh, uh, we are not testing the 100% of the population, but taking a subset to test something, right? True, that's so one true. problem uh, with this approach, uh, approach is, uh, let's say, uh, in case of uh, transactions, the companies hold transactions, okay? The chance of missing an anomaly uh, or a fraud transaction in this case is uh, much higher when we take a you know, subset of the total transactions. Because we know the, you know, the percentage of transaction, uh, no fraud transaction is very, very less. Uh, let's say uh, less than 0.1% or 0.01%. Uh, that's a normal case. So taking a subset will uh, uh, reduce the chance of detecting this unusual transaction. So that's an example. So here comes the importance of uh, uh, new technologies like, like AI. Uh, we don't want to uh, restrict the testing universe. Uh, we can scan all the media, data sources, document, uh, uh, everything to detect something. We have technologies like big data to do that. So that includes you know, uh, everything like structured, unstructured, like uh, databases, 
uh, unstructured uh, data like uh, email, social media, uh, like for insert the uh, recorded uh, you know, voice voice files, uh, even uh, the videos like the CCTV videos from the factory. Even that, even we can uh, analyze uh, you know the data and uh, identify some anomalies or uh, something unusual uh, from that data. So I think this approach. Uh, not only helping to identify the anomaly or fraud detection, I think you can also use this for uh, approach for uh, testing the complaints. Rather than testing the complaint using the subset of data, you can consider the whole data, 100% the data, the total universe uh, as the testing universe, then uh, identify, uh, you know, uh, do the complaints testing. And that's quite good. So, so what I understood from, from this discussion regarding whole field work, the amount of time that I was spending on doing all that document review and you know going through the process flows and then doing um, my testing on a sample basis that can the whole process can be transformed i don't have to sit and spend days going through those huge documents and coming up with my notes and key points you know ai can do that for me and um, i can analyze the interview and then also um, i don't have to worry about basing my opinions um, on a small sample, I can now go and test the whole population. And that gives me huge comfort and a lot of a much higher level of confidence um, in terms of um, stating my results of that audit. So that's really awesome. That really helps and that really um, answers a lot of questions in terms of field work. Um, Yeah, I think that's that's very important. Uh, and uh, all it takes uh, for you to start with is, you know, you need to have some courage to start somewhere, you know, like you can listen to all these beautiful stories, challenge it, uh, you know, accept it, whatever you want to do. But end of it, if you don't take, uh, you know, one step forward and say that, okay, okay, let's test it and see, is it real or is it going to happen? It's, I don't know. Yeah. So it's, yeah. you have to do that. No, uh, I think it's high time that we start embracing technology and we start giving, we all know that we are heading towards a time where we will have to, if we don't. Uh, so this change would be forced if we don't embrace it. So I think it's high time we start taking that, we start going through and applying, applying these techniques to our daily work so that um, our audit function is more uh, forward looking at it and it delivers the value that board and audit committee is looking for. Um, so let's uh, move on to um, the final phase is um, reporting. And what I see uh, typically in internal audit reporting, um, the way it is done, internal audit reports do the function a great disservice. When I see what is our final product which goes to the board and audit committee, these are internal audit reports. And if those internal audit reports don't communicate the message that they should, then all the effort that we put together <clears throat> from planning and field work and now reporting is kind of wasted, you know? Um, and also the initiative is lost by the time audit report is issued to DCM. And, and I've seen that, you know, typical audit started uh, through the planning and then few weeks of field work, then again, few weeks of reporting and then reviews. And by the time the report is out, it's we have consumed a lot of time that the real initiative that was trying to highlight to the attention of the board and audit committee that's already lost and i do understand that we do, we do have um those channels of communication with board and audit committee we can, where we can bring urgent matters to their attention and other piece that i see missing uh, in the audit reports for and that's an important one these reports report report opinion on sufficiency of internal controls rather than full range of risk responses. So in a typical audit report, when I'm reporting an issue, I talk about whether internal controls are sufficient or not in a particular area, but that's just one side of looking at it. There are whole multiple of risk factors which are linked and relying on each other and you know, if one of those risk indicators change, the scenario changes in many other way. So I come up with these findings in a very siloed approach because my risk assessment is not embedded. My internal controls testing is based on a sample basis and very siloed. So how do we make sure firstly that I improve on the timing of that report, the time I'm spending, how do I reduce that? And how do I make sure that the issues I'm reporting 
are actually taking care of an organizational view rather than a very siloed internal control based view yeah this is this is a uh, this is a lot of time consuming activity where we say that uh, where we see that a lot of time has been spent on preparing reports uh, but what i would say is that you know by having such a proactive system and uh, you know the first page of the report always has to be how many decisions have you made based on the recommendations given by the system it's not about a system giving you a lot of recommendations but are you really acting on it so and when it goes to the top management or the board of directors the first thing is that you know what do they want to see basically are they looking at the social development are they looking at the economic development or are they looking at finances or are they looking at is it a non profitable organization the benefit of the society or whatever it is so uh, with regards to that as a context whatever is the uh, you know the target and the goals of the organization the reports uh, let's say you take a typical audit report where you say that you know i've got five findings and just presenting those findings to your board of directors they may not get the real picture without telling them what is the financial impact and what is the regulatory impact and what is the reputational impact i remember uh, one of my experiences uh, you know doing an audit when i was presenting an audit report audit finding he said okay uh, i've got a compliance deviation okay okay that's fine we will manage it then i told okay this compliance deviation is a regulatory issue i said he said we will address it okay then i said uh, you know you're going to have a 100000 dollars fine coming up by the early next month that's when he started okay how can you look into you know a financial impact right so you've got a compliance deviation which is a regulatory issue now if you don't address it you're going to be in the newspaper for all the all the all the wrong reasons because it was a government organization and you're going to have all these things coming to you but what i'm trying to tell you is that you know the impact of each of the finding and you already have uh, the risk assessment which is more of a proactive so what you have is very simple dashboard to all the users based on their uh, you know roles within the organizations and they don't really need reports anymore that's what i feel because yeah, um, no i i would just want to clarify here the iia's standards uh, they are not asking for doing a report they're talking about communicating the results of the audit and it it can be in any form and what you're telling me farooq so my internal audit report is getting getting generated on the move yeah it is because you've already giving all the inputs because report is a by product so we have done all the hard work so i don't think you have to sit alone again on another few weekends to prepare them or you know get so even the approval cycle you know based on the recommendation it goes to the relevant people and if they are not acting it it can also be escalated to the next level so those things can be done very much so it's on the move and it is dynamic and i have one more question um, um, so this is in terms of timing so i have improved my timing yeah. significantly it's very dynamic on the move report pretty much ready with the dashboards which give a whole business spectrum but how do i bring this perspective of linking my observation with the business objectives you know um, in in a typical um, audit report i would just say and typically talk about the sufficiency of internal controls whether internal controls are weak here and we found these control weaknesses or compliance issues but how do i uh, you know communicate these observation or how do i put these ob observations forward where i can make a connection with business objectives and i can talk to the decision makers in their language i think uh, that's a very important point which you have brought on uh, so generally what happens is that you know i believe the process is the heart of your business so whatever findings you have it is generally connected to your business processes and its relevant controls so as and when you have the findings it gets automatically updated into your business process portfolio right and then you know because the moment you have them listed as a high risk in your business process portfolio what happens is that you know then it becomes a, a part of your risk assessment so as risk assessment is not only a static and predefined one it falls in line and it has to get treated all right so um that's 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 quite awesome um, um so what i understand starting right from the beginning from my risk assessment which is getting embedded into the systems and processes becoming dynamic very forward looking then i'm moving on to my planning process or this 
dynamic risk assessment is feeding into my audit plan, which is not static and dynamic. And then I'm saving a lot of time in the audit field work. Um, and then my report is getting generated on the move and which is very much synced with the business objectives, uh, Farooq. We are talking about a total revamp of the way we do here. It's a very simple thing because we are talking about one business. So you don't have a business as usual and a list of management systems and frameworks on the other side. So the business as usual has to be infused into your system. And you know the management systems and the audits is not just administration burden, right? So I'll just pass this slide to Renjit because he'd be the right person to talk about the typical technology side of it. Renjit, keep it easy. I don't know, so that people are, you know, very, yeah, it's easy, easy to understand, yeah. I always talk these technical terms, sorry for <laughs> <laughs> So maybe I can put this uh, common AI technologies into four buckets as you see in this slide. The first one is the uh, data foundation, you know, where we use the various data mining techniques to extract information from different types of data sources. For example, in uh, auditing, uh, let's say the regulatory documents are generally a long document, what I understand. And hence, you now they are unstructured data. So using the data mining and pattern recognition, uh, we can programmatically extract any particular field in the document and maybe use for uh, the next step, like creating the checklist or something. So uh, that's not a you know, application of the data mining in your field. And uh, we have a knowledge graph, which is a uh, very recent technology used for uh, gathering the data from different uh, sources. Uh, it links the information you know, from different locations. It can link the information from a structured as well as uh, unstructured uh, location. Uh, uh, one example is like if you want to connect your financial transaction from a database to uh, some Excel or uh, Word reports to generate some insights that no, there you can use the technologies like knowledge data. When it comes to analytics, uh, predictive modeling has uh, a lot of applications. For example, uh, assessment of uh, you know the regulatory compliance risk, where uh, we can able to predict the compliance risk for risk probability. We can use the predictive modeling there uh, in the analytics. And uh, uh, Paul mentioned about the dashboard, like you know. Once all the data sources are connected, we can bring into a dashboard to see everything simple, not seeing any you know, the technical like neural network or anything. Right? We can see everything simple as simple uh, charts or a graph. So uh, one example like uh, governance risk and complaints dashboard, uh, you know, is one example of uh, uh, you know, uh, dashboard that we can powerful dashboard that we can create. The third bucket is the process automation is another brilliant technology, I would say. Uh, we can use the robotic process automation, uh, RPA, to automate the, you know, the repetitive processes that human do. For example, uh, you know, your business process involved uh, collecting, let's say, customer information from several thousands of documents. And sometimes we need to you know, do the copy paste, copying the email of the customer and put it in some structured format. We can bring the, technology like RPA, the robot can do that. Like RPA, just apply to it, and the biggest advantage is very fast, uh, and it can avoid the human errors also sometimes. Okay, so that's a, a very good technology where we can uh, automate the processes. And the last bucket is uh, the cognitive intelligence, uh, where we have uh, the NLP, the natural language processing, I already mentioned earlier. Uh, we can process uh, the unstructured data, like text, uh, voice recordings, video, images. Uh, you can also, you know, analyze your, in case of auditing, like your meeting notes, emails, even voice recorded, like I already mentioned about it, or the, you know, the recorded conversation between the clients. And maybe you can check any breach of complaints. So that NLP, we can use it. Machine learning and deep learning uh, are, you know, they are most commonly used uh, AI techniques. Uh, you know, they have uh, plenty of applications, like, uh, let's say classifying transactions into normal or uh, unusual, uh, predicting the cyber threats, and so many applications uh, are there for the, uh, you know, the machine learning and deep learning. So these are the common, these are not all, but some of the most common technologies used for, uh, you know, uh, using the AI uh, umbrella. Uh, thanks very much, Ranjit. Thanks for giving this overview. So these, these, these are all the techniques that we can use at the back end to make it look very simple and very, 
dynamic uh, for the users, right? So this is great. I would just want to say we are receiving a lot of questions and a lot of people raising hands as well. Um, and this, and what we'll do towards the end of the this webinar, we would suggest that you send all those questions to us via email, and we can all answer those questions uh, to all of them. So in this webinar, we'll quickly uh, move on to wrap it up, and then you know uh, we are open to receive questions afterwards. Um, yeah, so, just one question. yeah, just one question. Does the technology really matter for an internal audit team as long as you get to see what is really happening? Okay, you can always understand and learn more about it. But the end result, if it is really working well, is it is it something the way people look at it? Or how is it like? Farooq, to me, it's 100% um, it's worth doing it. And yeah. it's not a choice anymore, I believe. That's my thinking. If you really want to have an internal audit function, if you really want to move on to a status of trusted advisor, you need to come up with those business insights. You need to be talking in the business language. You need to be delivering that value which is expected of you. And you know that survey results which are coming from last few years, those need to change. And those are asking big questions on the value of the function itself. So I personally think I would want to go with it and I would, I would love, you know, going ahead and applying these things. It's, it's ultimately helping myself, you know, it's helping me a lot and do what I'm doing and helping the business. So, um, so this takes us to the um, very end where we're, that's the whole objective that we are trying to achieve to be more future focused audit and audit where the risk is going to be not where it has been. And, you know, I personally see my value as chief audit executive, you know, preventing an internal control or risk issue when I can, rather than identifying them when they already exist. I see my success as the success of management. If management has implemented a system which lacked internal controls when I had the opportunity to fix it at the first time and I didn't do that, that reflects badly on audit function as well. So, there are a couple of things is one is real time assurance um, uh, for Um I've been involved in various, um, you know, multi-million dollar projects auditing those and my CEO used to say, hey, Imran, don't tell me towards the end of the project that this went wrong and this was not right. I need to know right now what's going on. So how do we bring in that perspective of real time assurance and how does this whole um, AI can help us to be auditing and providing advice on the go i would say that uh, i would say that you know when you actually look into the the typical million dollar business cases and you know that has to fall into the risk assessment i believe that you know you do a risk assessment and that should not uh, fall in a separate corner without adding into your tip, you know the organizational risk practices so it has to join the queue first of all you know if you have to have something to be added on top of it and then it has to go through the risk assessment process and it says that okay these are the you know million dollar projects which we have done in the past and these are the detections and you know this is how we detect and identify this has been it's been analyzed and these are the impacts what we had in the past so the machines can again identify and understand and say that you know these are the history this this is what it's been done and these were the potential positive and negative impacts you had so when you start with the first business case you have got a lot of business cases which you have done in the past that's the first thing to be looked at and the second thing, when you have, you know, a proactive monitoring system in place, you know, you're not talking about, you know, anything reactive. Yes, you have reactive things, but I'm talking about what's happening, right? So if you look at the typical analytics flow, which we have showed in the beginning, what we are talking about, a complete process flow of what happened, okay, which we already know what is happening and what is likely to happen. And on top of everything, it says that, okay, we can detect, we can analyze, but at the same time, you can also recommend the solutions, right? Okay, this, you can try this. So these are the best way to mitigate or resolve your problems, but everything is connected to your organizational goals, not just the sake of completing a list register like what you have told, right? Yeah. It has to be, uh, a very strong connection or a very strong collaboration between the key functions, the corporate governance, the process improvement team, the business excellence team, and the compliance team with internal audit. Internal audit cannot be an advisor alone. It has to be a team. 
Absolutely. Well, Farooq, uh, this, you've rounded it up really well. Um, and I think um, with all that we have discussed, that gives us great insight and gives us great food for thought as well as to where we are going and um, are we really on the mark and what are the technologies that we can use to totally transform the way we are doing our business uh, in internal audit. And, you know, I, I keep saying that now, you know, we all see as internal auditor, uh, it's coming and we need to embrace and adapt to that. You know, there might be two approaches and I, and I say that, you know, either you can be an ostrich or you can be a meerkat. When ostrich sees a danger or a risk coming, it ducks his head in the sand and assumes everything is fine around it. And while the meerkat stands tall and scans the horizon and, you know, plans a strategy to deal with the risk. So it now lies with us. We can either be sit in the first row or we can sit in the last row, you know, just go with the wind. But I think it's very important if we really want to transform, if we really want to become trusted as advisor and if we want to elevate um, the function um, overall, we need to embrace a technology and we need to um, follow and um, we, need, we should be able to deliver the value that has been um, expected of us. So I think these are the typical, um, these are some skills for the future um, about the recent surveys done. And Farooq, would you quickly run us through these? Yeah, I would say that, you know, we know that where we are in this, so sometimes we don't want to adapt it. We are forced to adapt it to the, like the situation what we are in right now. And, you know, some people want to start from the scratch. Some people are, you know, some of the internal audit experts want to apply and see, you know, like I'm a person where I, I, I try applying and learn, you know, on the go, get hit and learn. So depending on where you are and, you know, some of the, some of our, some of them are completely, uh, you know, uh, you know, completely, completely want to transform everything, the entire processes and the whole thing as we explained. And one question I generally get in, in all these things in terms of investing as an individual to learn and upskill yourself, Absolutely. you know, this is a time you need to invest and most of the information or insights are available. So let's remember that, you know, we don't have typewriters anymore and we can also think of those public telephone booths. So, it's, it's like there is a transformation and we need to adapt it at some point of time. I think, you know, that's, that's something which we all have to look at. We need to upskill and it's not going to take away our job. All these technologies are going to help us and to have more family time, you know, so, you know, yeah. that, that, so I look at it as an end point, not as a business goals. Yeah. <laughs> no, I agree hundred percent. I think it's a, it's a great insight in there. Um, we really have to reskill ourselves. Um, the type of skills that we have, we need to change and we should be able to adapt to the technology and the way profession is heading towards. So um, thank you so very much for uh, Farooq and Ranjit um, uh, for being here. And I thank you all, the, thank all the attendees uh, who have attended. Um, and I would suggest that if you have any questions, do reach out to us through this email, uh, email your questions to us and we would be uh, very happy to answer uh, all the questions and um, stay safe, stay at home. Um, have a great day ahead. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Before we close, just one thing which I wanted to tell you because of the investment you generally make in such a system, uh, people look at it, okay, we are looking at cost saving right now. So this is a serious investment in terms of the amount of time and energy and money you're saving is going to be huge. So you need to explore it to understand what exactly are you saving. So thank you very much, everyone. And thank you very much, Imran, for joining so early and everyone who's been there. Yeah, so. Thank, thank you, Imran. And thank, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Ranjit and Farooq. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.